Happy Sabbath! How are you all? Are you enjoying today's nice sunshine? After the rain, we really appreciate the sun, isn't it? We also enjoy the rain because we needed it. Tonight, I pray that the Lord will continue to bless each one of you and your family, that His joy, His peace, and His love will fill you. Last week, we studied how long Noah was in the ark. And we also talked about God's promise after Noah and his family came out of the big ark. Noah offered a sacrifice of thanksgiving and atonement, and God accepted it. God promised that there will be no more great flood to destroy the world. And he gave man the rainbow as a sign to prove of his promise. Tonight, we're going to continue with the story, and we will study about Noah and his sons from chapter 9 of Genesis, starting from verse 18. In this chapter, there is a strange story, and I'm going to talk about it tonight. And this story raised many questions about why Noah did what he did and why he cursed Canaan. We will try our best to get some understanding of it. Let me start reading from verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. So it looked like Noah didn't have any more children because it says from Shem, Japheth, and Ham, came the world's population. And Ham was the forefather of the Canaanites. You know, the Canaanites was, were the people who occupied the promised land. Starting verse 20 now. Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. So after the flood, Noah had to start farming so he could provide for himself and his family. A balanced meal not only need meat, right? You need vegetable, you need fruits. So probably that's what Noah was doing. So he did all kinds of farming and farming must have been difficult because of the change of climate. You know, before the flood, the climate was mild and temperate no extreme temperature until after the flood. And also make farming difficult with the soil. The original soil on the land surface have probably completely destroyed. And now ranging from clay, sand, rock all mixed together and the debris. So he is to sort through all this to farm. And he probably planted many things, experimenting what would work and what wouldn't work in this post-flood condition. And among these things that he planted, he planted a vineyard. The verse said he drank the wine from the vineyard and became drunk and uncovered himself inside the tent. So why did Noah drink until he was drunk? Historians said people in the ancient time might have picked ripe grapes and put them in a container and some juicy grapes at the bottom of the container were crushed together and as the grapes broke open, yeast on the skins went to work, turning sugar from the fruit into alcohol. Do you know that there are natural yeast on the grape skins? Well, this is the fermentation process that turned grapes, grape juice into wine. Well, personally, I think Noah, without knowing it, he created an alcoholic beverage. Because, you know, that's the first mentioning of wine in the Bible. Let's read on. Starting verse 22. Ham, 
the father of Canaan saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Sham and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their shoulders and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were turned away, so they did not see the father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Well, there are questions raised from this passage, and I will try to explain it with the help of Angel Manuel Rodriguez. He was, he was a SDA theologian and director of Biblical Research Institute before his retirement. So the question, why was Ham being punished so severely just because he saw his father's nakedness? The biblical passage here has been interpreted in many ways, suggesting that this is a difficult passage to understand. The main problem is about the sin of Ham. What does the phrase, he saw his father naked, mean? And the second problem is, why was such a severe punishment inflicted on, not Ham, but Ham's son? Before I address this question, let me show you in brief the different interpretations of this passage. The first interpretation, some said it was an inappropriate sexual act. These interpreters said that this passage here is about Ham's sexual misconduct. They said this actual phrase, saw his father naked, meaning Ham uncovered the nakedness of his father. They use Leviticus 20.17 as their support. And that passage actually describes sexual intercourse. So this group of interpreters suggests that this is a case of paternal father and son incest. Other interpreters have suggested that this could mean to have a sexual relationship with the father's wife. They use the verse in Leviticus 18.7 to support their reason. So what it means that is that Ham had violated Noah's wife, according to these interpreters. And still more outrageous interpretation. They said Ham had castrated his father. This based on the description in verse 24. What does 24 say? what his youngest son had done to him. And they said that that is why Noah had no more children, although he lived another 350 years. While these suggestions are not valid, because they are ignoring or getting away from the immediate context of the story, so how shall we interpret this passage? So according to the context and language, is that this passage never said that Ham uncover the nakedness of his father. It's not there. What is mentioned is a drunken Noah who before fallen into his drunken stupor, he removed his clothes and was lying uncovered inside his tent. According to the Hebrew vocabulary, the verb G-A-L-A-H in this particular case means to expose oneself. So Noah exposed himself. No one else did. He exposed himself. 
Nothing in the context suggests that Ham uncovered his father. It says Ham saw the nakedness of his father. So this makes highly unlikely the suggestion of incest or having sex with Noah's wife or even castration. Furthermore, in the story, the verb to see is understood in a literal sense. It's not figurative. So just now we explained that according to the Hebrew language, Noah uncovered himself and Ham saw him. In the story, we are also told that his two brothers took precaution to avoid seeing the father naked. They took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked backward and covered their father's nakedness. This is in verse 23. And the text, this passage even adds, their faces would turn the other way so that they would not see their father's nakedness. So it is impossible to argue that the verb to see meaning Ham actually uncovered his father. See, because the brothers, you, you saw it, right? The brothers did all they could to avoid seeing what Ham had seen. So this is the plain sense of the text, and it does not support any other interpretation. Then you probably ask, what is the sin of Ham? You know, in the ancient Near East, what Ham did would have been a serious matter. It was not what he saw only, but also about what he told others about it. These two actions he saw, he told a purposeful acts. Even if the first action saw may have been accidental, but then if we look at the verbs being used here, R-A-A-H, to see actually means to inspect, to look at something purposefully. Well, that explained that Ham showed great disrespect for his father and violated the fifth commandment to honor one's parents. So the curse pronounced by Noah was not actually a curse per this theologian. He said that it was actually a request to God, a request for justice. And it was not intended to secure the fate of Ham's son, Canaan. And Noah's curse may Canaan be, Ham, be Sham's servant. What does that mean? Well, conquered people were called servants. Even if they were not household or private slaves, Sham, the ancestor of Israel, and the other Samites were to be the masters of Ham's descendants, the Canaanites. We know that years later that Canaanites would give their lands to Shem's descendants, the Israelites, right? If you have read Exodus, you know that. You know, this passage also interpreted differently by some people a few generations back. These people were kind of prejudiced, and they say that the descendants of Canaan, Can Canaan are the black people from Africa and they used the curse on Canaan to justify slavery but black people did not come from Canaan Canaan was the father of the near eastern people and many of whom were conquered by Joshua when Israel took the promised land but why did Noah curse Ham's son. The story imply Ham's son Canaan possesses similar characteristics like his father. The narrative may sound somewhat strange, 
but it tells us something about family responsibilities and the need to avoid wrongdoings that may result in pain for parents, children, and even the subsequent generations. So Noah blessed Shem and also his other son, Yaf Japheth, because both of them respected him and they covered him. So Noah said, may God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. What does dwell in the tents mean? This means that spiritual blessings would come to the descendants of Japheth through the God of Shem. Who are Japheth's descendants? Japheth is usually thought of as the father of the Europeans and the father of the Japhetic race, equating the Japhetic nations to Europeans. He is known to be the ancestor of all Indo-European nations. The majority of his descendants are situated in northwestern regions like Anatolia and Aegean. However, there are also assumptions that Japheth is the father of the Asian or Mongolian people. Well, how would dwell in the tents of Sham be a blessing for Japheth? The line of Sham is where the Messiah would come from. And not only Japheth's descendants, but the whole world would benefit from salvation through the Messiah. So the last two verses, Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So all the days of Noah were 950 years and he died. He lived an old, old age. And we know that after him, gradually they lived, the lifespan was shorter and shorter. So, what does this chapter teach us about God's character? God seems to be silent in this narrative. At times, God allows men to learn from their own experience. We don't have the privilege to all the details of this story. Therefore, we really don't have the complete understanding of Ham's action. Second question. What does this chapter tell us about who we are as a human? We make mistakes, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. Either ways, we reap the consequences. And sometimes the consequences would even affect our children and even generations afterward. Third question. And what does this story tell us about how we should live? The story points out that we need to be vigilant because as I have already mentioned, what takes place in the family as a social nucleus will have a negative or positive impact long afterward. Next week, we will continue with this narrative but this time we're going to move on to chapter 10. Happy Sabbath. <laughs>